Part the Third, The Euphorbia, Section One of Thais by Anatole France. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Euphorbia. Paphnutius had returned to the holy desert. He took near Athribis the boat which went up the Nile to carry food to the monastery of Abbot Serapion. When he disembarked, his disciples advanced to meet him with great demonstrations of joy. Some raised their arms to heaven, others, prostrate on the ground, kissed the abbot's sandals. For they knew already what the saint had accomplished in Alexandria. The monks generally received, by rapid and unknown means, information concerning the safety or glory of the church. News spread through the desert with the rapidity of the simoon. When Paphnutius strode across the sand, his disciples followed him, praising the Lord. Flavian, who was the oldest member of the brotherhood, was suddenly seized with a pious frenzy, and began to sing an inspired hymn. O oh, blessed day! Now is our Father restored to us. He has returned laden with fresh merits, of which we reap the benefits." For the virtues of the father are the wealth of the children, and the sanctity of the abbot illuminates every cell. Paphnutius, our father, has given a new spouse to Jesus Christ. By his wondrous art he has changed a black sheep into a white sheep. And now, behold, he has returned to us, laden with fresh merits, like unto the bee of the Arsinoetid, heavy with the nectar of flowers even as the ram of Nubia, which could hardly bear the weight of its abundant wool. Let us celebrate this day by mingling oil with our food. When they came to the door of the abbot's cell, they fell on their knees and said, Let our father bless us and give each of us a measure of oil to celebrate his return. Paul the fool, who alone had remained standing, asked, Who is this man? and did not recognize Paphnutius. But no one paid any attention to what he said, as he was known to be devoid of intelligence, though filled with piety. The abbot of Antinoe, locked in his cell, thought, I have at last regained the heaven of my repose and happiness. I have returned to my fortress of contentment. But how is it that this roof of rushes, so dear to me, does not receive me as a friend, and the walls say not to me, Thou art welcome? Nothing has changed since my departure. In this abode I have chosen. There is my table and my bed. There is the mummy's head, which has so often inspired me with salutary thoughts. And there is the book in which I have so often sought conceptions of God. And yet nothing that I left is here. The things appear grievously despoiled of their customary charm, and it seems to me as though I saw them today for the first time. When I look at that table and couch, that in former days I made with my own hands, that black dried head, these rolls of papyrus filled with the sayings of God, I seem to see the belongings of a dead man. After having known them all so well, I know them no longer. Alas, since nothing around me has really changed, it is I who am no longer what I was. I am another. I am the dead man. What has happened, my God? What has been taken from me? What is left unto me? And who am I? And it especially perplexed him to find, in spite of himself, that his cell was small, whereas when viewed by the eye of faith he ought to consider it immense because the infinitude of God began there. He began to pray with his face against the ground. 
and felt a little happier. He had hardly been an hour in prayer when a vision of Thais passed before his eyes. He returned thanks to God. Jesus, it is thou who hast sent her. I acknowledge in that thy wonderful goodness. Thou wouldst please me, reassure me, and comfort me by the sight of her whom I have given to thee. Thou presentest her to my eyes with her smile, now disarmed, her grace, now become innocent, her beauty from which I have extracted the sting. To please me, my God, thou showest her to me, as I have prepared and purify her for thy designs, as one friend pleasantly reminds another of the rich gift he has received from him. Therefore I see this woman with delight, being assured that the vision comes from thee. Thou dost not forget that I have given her to thee, Jesus. Keep her, since she pleases thee, and suffer not her beauty to give joy to any but thyself. He could not sleep all night, and he saw Thais more distinctly than he had seen her in the Grotto of Nymphs. He commended himself, saying, What I have done, I have done to the glory of God. Yet, to his great surprise, his heart was not at ease. He sighed. Why art thou sad, O my soul, and why dost thou trouble me? And his mind was still perturbed. Thirty days he remained in that condition of sadness which precedes the sore trials of a solitary monk. The image of Thais never left him day or night. He did not try to banish it, because he still thought it came from God and was the image of a saint. But one morning she visited him in a dream, her hair crowned with violets, and her very gentleness seemed so formidable that he uttered a cry of fright and woke in an icy sweat. His eyes were still heavy with sleep when he felt a moist, warm breath on his face. A little jackal, its two paws placed on the side of the bed, was panting its stinking breath in his face, grinning at him. Paphnutius was greatly astonished, and it seemed to him as though a tower had given way under his feet. And, in fact, he had fallen, for his self-confidence had gone. For some time he was incapable of thought, and when he did recover himself, his meditations only increased his perplexity. It is one of two things, he said to himself. Either this vision, like the preceding ones, came from God, and was a good vision, and it is my natural perversity which has misrepresented it, as wine turns sour in a dirty cup. I have, by my unworthiness, changed instruction into reproach, of which this diabolical jackal immediately took advantage. Or, else, this vision came not from God, but, on the contrary, from the devil, and was evil. In that case, I should doubt whether the former ones had, as I thought, a celestial origin. I am therefore incapable of that discernment which is necessary for the ascetic. In either case, it is plain that God is no longer with me, of which I feel the effects though I cannot explain the cause. He reasoned in this way, and anxiously asked, Just God, what trials dost thou appoint for thy servants, if the apparitions of thy saints are a danger for them? Give me to discern by an intelligible sign that which comes from thee, and that which comes from the other. And, as God, whose designs are inscrutable, did not see fit to enlighten his servant, Paphnutius, 
lost in doubt, resolved not to think of Thais any more. But his resolutions were vain. Though absent, she was ever with him. She gazed at him whilst he read, or meditated, or prayed, or met his eyes wherever he looked. Her imaginary approach was heralded by a slight sound, such as is made by a woman's dress when she walks, and the visions had more verisimilitude than reality itself, which moves and is confused, whereas the phantoms which are caused by solitude are fixed and unchangeable. She came under various appearances, sometimes pensive, her head crowned with her last perishable wreath, clad as at the banquet at Alexandria, in a mauve robe spangled with silver flowers, sometimes voluptuously in a cloud of light veils, and bathed in the warm shadows of the grotto of nymphs, sometimes in a serge cassock, pious and radiant with celestial joy, sometimes tragic, her eyes swimming in the terrors of death, and showing her bare breast bedewed with the blood from her pierced heart. What disturbed him the most in these visions was that the wreaths, tunics, and veils that he had burned with his own hands should thus return. It became evident to him that these things had an imperishable soul, and he cried, Lo, all the countless souls of the sins of Thais come upon me. When he turned away his head, he felt that Thais was behind him, and that made him feel still more uneasy. His torture was cruel, but as his soul and body remained pure in the midst of all his temptations, he trusted in God and gently complained to him. My God, if I went so far to seek her amongst the Gentiles, it was for thy sake and not for mine. It would not be just that I should suffer for what I have done in thy behalf. Protect me, sweet Jesus, my Savior, save me. Suffer not the phantom to accomplish that which the body could not. As I have triumphed over the flesh, Suffer not the shadow to overthrow me. I know that I am now exposed to greater dangers than I ever ran. I feel and know that the dream has more power than the reality. And how could it be otherwise, since it is itself but a higher reality? It is the soul of things. Plato, though he was but an idolater, has testified to the real existence of ideas. At that banquet of demons, to which thou accompaniedst me, Lord, I heard men, sullied with crimes, truly, but certainly not devoid of intelligence, agree to acknowledge that we see real objects in solitude, meditation, and ecstasy. And thy scriptures, my God, many times affirm the virtue of dreams, and the power of visions formed either by thee, great God, or by thy adversary. There was a new man in him, and now he reasoned with God, but God did not choose to enlighten him. His nights were one long dream, and his days did not differ from his nights. One morning he awoke, uttering sighs, such as issue by moonlight from the tombs of the victims of crimes. Thais had come, showing her bleeding feet, and whilst he wept, he had slipped into his couch. There was no longer any doubt. The image of Thais was an impure image. His heart filled with disgust, he leaped out of his profane couch and hid his face in his hands that he might not see the daylight. The hours passed, but they did not remove his shame. All was quiet in his cell. For the first time for many days, Paphnutius was alone. The phantom had at last left him, and even its absence seemed dreadful. 
nothing, nothing to distract his mind from the recollection of the dream. Full of horror, he thought, why did I not drive her away? Why did I not tear myself from her cold arms and burning knees? He no longer dared to pronounce the name of God near that horrible couch, and he feared that his cell, being profaned, the demons might freely enter at any hour. His fears did not deceive him. The seven little jackals, which had never crossed the threshold, entered in a file and went and hid under the bed. At the vesper hour there came in an eighth, the stench of which was horrible. The next day a ninth joined the others, and soon there were thirty, then sixty, then eighty. They became smaller as they multiplied, and being no bigger than rats, they covered the floor, the couch, and the stool. One of them jumped on the little table by the side of the bed, and standing with its four feet together on the death's head, looked at the monk with burning eyes, and every day fresh jackals came. To expiate the abominable sin of his dream, and flee from impure thoughts, Paphnutius determined to leave his cell, which had now become polluted, go far into the desert and practice unheard of austerities, strange labors, and fresh works of grace. But before putting his design into action, he went to see old Palamon and ask his advice. He found him in his garden, watering his lettuces. It was the evening, the blue Nile flowed at the foot of violet hills. The good old man was walking slowly in order not to frighten a pigeon that had perched on his shoulder. "'The Lord be with thee, Brother Paphnutius,' he said. "'Admire his goodness. He sends me the animals that he has created that I may converse with them of his works, and praise him in the birds of the air.' Look at this pigeon, note the changing hues of its neck, and say, Is it not a beautiful work of God? But have you not come to talk with me, brother, on some pious subject? If so, I will put down my watering pot and listen to you. Paphnutius told the old man about his journey, his return, the visions of his days and the dreams of his nights without omitting the sinful one and the pack of jackals. Do you not think, father, he added, that I ought to bury myself in the desert and perform some extraordinary austerities that would even astonish the devil? I am but a poor sinner, replied Palamon, and I know little about men having passed all my life in this garden with gazelles, little hares, and pigeons. But it seems to me, brother, that your distemper comes from your having passed too suddenly from the noisy world to the calm of solitude. Such sudden transitions can but do harm to the health of the soul. You are, brother, like a man who exposes himself almost at the same time, to great heat and great cold. A cough shakes him, and fever torments him. In your place, brother Paphnutius, instead of retiring at once into some awful desert, I should take such amusements as are fitting to a monk and a holy abbot. I should visit the monasteries in the neighborhood. Some of them are wonderful, it is said. That of Abbot Serapion contains, I have been told, a thousand four hundred and thirty-two cells, and the monks are divided into as many legions as there are letters in the Greek alphabet. I am even informed that a certain analogy is observed between the character of the monks and the shape of the letters by which they are designated, and that, for example, those who are placed under Z have a tortuous character, while those under I have an upright mind. If I were you, brother, I should go and assure myself of this with my own eyes. 
and I should know no rest until I had seen such a wonderful thing. I should not fail to study the regulations of the various communities which are scattered along the banks of the Nile, so as to be able to compare one with another. As such study is befitting a religious man like yourself. You have heard say, no doubt, that Abbot Ephraim has drawn up for his monastery pious regulations of great beauty. With his permission, you might make a copy of them. As you are a skillful penman, I could not do so, for my hands, accustomed to wield the spade, are too awkward to direct the thin reed of the scribe over the papyrus. But you have the knowledge of letters, brother, and should thank God for it, for beautiful writing cannot be too much admired. The work of the copyist and the reader is a great safeguard against evil thoughts. And brother Paphnutius, why do you not write out the teachings of our fathers, Paul and Anthony? Little by little you would recover in these pious works peace of soul and mind. Solitude would again become pleasant to your heart, and soon you would be in a condition to recommence those ascetic works which your journey has interrupted. But you must not expect much benefit from excessive penitence. When he was among us, our father Antony used to say, Excessive fasting produces weakness, and weakness begets idleness. There are some monks who ruin their bodies by fasts improperly prolonged. Of them it may be said that they plunge a dagger into their own breast and deliver themselves up unresistingly into the power of the devil. So said the holy man, Antony. I am but a foolish old man, but by the grace of God I have remembered what our father told us. Paphnutius thanked Palamon, and promised to think over his advice. When he had passed the fence of reeds which enclosed the little garden, he turned round and saw the good old gardener engaged in watering his salads, whilst the pigeon walked about on his bent back. And at that sight Paphnutius felt ready to weep. On returning to his cell, he found there a strange turmoil, as though it were filled with grains of sand, blown about by a strong wind. And on looking closer, he saw these moving bodies were myriads of little jackals. That night he saw in a dream a high stone column surmounted by a human face, and he heard a voice which said, Ascend this pillar. On awakening, he felt confident that this dream had been sent from heaven. He called his disciples and addressed them in these words. My beloved sons, I must leave you, and go where God sends me. During my absence, obey Flavian as you would me, and take care of our brother Paul. Bless you. Farewell. As he strode away, they remained prostrate on the ground, and when they raised their heads, they saw his tall, dark figure on the sandy horizon. He walked day and night until he reached the ruins of the temple, formerly built by the idolaters, in which he had slept amongst the scorpions and sirens on his former strange journey. The walls covered with magic signs, were still standing. Thirty immense columns, which terminated in human heads or lotus flowers, still supported a heavy stone entablature. But at one end of the temple a pillar had shaken off its old burden and stood isolated. It had for its capital the head of a woman, which smiled with long eyes and rounded cheeks, and on her forehead cow's horns. Paphnutius, on seeing it, recognized the column which had been shown him in his dream, 
and he calculated that it was thirty-two cubits high. He went to the neighboring village and ordered a ladder of that height to be made, and when the ladder was placed against the pillar, he ascended, knelt down on the top, and said to the Lord, Here then, O God, is the abode thou hast chosen for me. May I remain here in thy grace until the hour of my death. He had brought no provisions with him, trusting in divine providence, and expecting that charitable peasants would give him all that he needed. And, in fact, the next day, about the ninth hour, women came with their children bringing bread, dates, and fresh water, which the boys carried to the top of the column. The top of the pillar was not large enough to allow the monk to lie at full length, so that he slept with his legs crossed and his head on his breast, and sleep was a more cruel torture to him than his wakeful hours. At dawn the ospreys brushed him with their wings, and he awoke filled with pain and terror. It happened that the carpenter who made the ladder feared God, Disturbed at the thought that the saint was exposed to the sun and rain, and fearing that he might fall in his sleep, this pious man constructed a roof and a railing on the top of the column. Soon the report of this extraordinary existence spread from village to village, and the laborers of the valley came on Sundays with their wives and children to look at the stylite. The disciples of Paphnutius having learned with surprise the place of this wonderful retreat, came to him and obtained from him permission to build their huts at the foot of the column. Every morning they came and stood in the circle around the master and received from him the words of instruction. My sons, he said to them, continue like those little children whom Jesus loved. That is the way of salvation. The sin of the flesh is the source and origin of all sins. They spring from it as from a parent. Pride, avarice, idleness, anger, and envy are its dearly beloved progeny. I have seen this in Alexandria. I have seen rich men carried away by the vice of lust, which, like a river with a turbid flood, swept them into the gulf of bitterness." The abbots of Ephraim and Serapion, being informed of his strange proceeding, wished to behold him with their own eyes. Seeing from afar on the river the triangular sail which was bringing them to him, Paphnutius could not prevent himself from thinking that God had made him an example to all solitary monks. The two abbots, when they saw him, did not conceal their surprise, and having consulted together, they agreed in condemning such an extraordinary penance, and exhorted Paphnutius to come down. Such a mode of life is contrary to all usage, they said. It is peculiar and against all rules. But Paphnutius replied, What is the monastic life, if not peculiar? And ought not the deeds of a monk to be as eccentric as he is himself? It was a sign from God that caused me to descend here. It is a sign from God that will make me descend. Every day religious men came to join the disciples of Paphnutius, and they built for themselves shelters round the aerial hermitage. Several of them, to imitate the saint, mounted the ruins of the temple, but being reproved by their brethren, and conquered by fatigue, they soon gave up these attempts. Pilgrims flocked from all parts. There were some who had come long distances, and were hungry and thirsty. The idea occurred to a poor widow of selling fresh water and melons. Against the foot of the column, behind her bottles of red clay, her cups and her fruit under an awning, of blue and white striped canvas, she cried, Who wants to drink? Following the example of this widow, a baker brought some bricks and made an oven close by, in the hope of selling loaves and cakes to visitors. 
As the crowd of visitors increased unceasingly, and the inhabitants of the large cities of Egypt began to come, some man, greedy of gain, built a caravansary to lodge the guests and their servants, camels and mules. Soon there was, in front of the column, a market to which the fishermen of the Nile brought their fish, and the gardeners their vegetables. A barber who shaved people in the open air amused the crowd with his jokes. The old temple, so long given over to silence and solitude, was filled with countless sights and sounds of life. The innkeepers turned the subterranean vaults into cellars, and nailed on the old pillars signs surmounted by the figure of the holy Paphnutius, and bearing this inscription in Greek and Egyptian, pomegranate wine, fig wine, and genuine Cilician beer, sold here. On the walls, sculptured with pure and graceful carvings, the shopkeepers hung ropes of onions and smoked fish, dead hares, and the carcasses of sheep, in the evening, the old occupants of the ruins, the rats, scuttled in long row to the river, whilst the ibises, suspiciously craning their necks, purged on the high cornices, to which rose the smoke of the kitchens, the shouts of the drinkers, and the cries of the tapsters. All around, builders laid out streets, and masons constructed convents, chapels, and churches, by the end of six months a city was established with a guardhouse and a tribunal, a prison and a school kept by an old blind scribe. The pilgrims were innumerable. Bishops and other church dignitaries came full of admiration. The patriarch of Antioch, who chanced to be in Egypt at that time, came with all his clergy. He highly approved of the extraordinary conduct of the stylite, and the heads of the Libyan church followed, in the absence of Athanasius, the opinion of the patriarch. Having learned which, abbots Ephraim and Serapion came to the feet of Paphnutius to apologize for their former mistrust. Paphnutius replied, No, my brothers, that the penance I endure is barely equal to the temptations which are sent me, the number and force of which astound me. A man viewed externally is but small, and, from the height of the pillar to which God has called me, I see human beings moving about like ants. But, considered internally, man is immense, he is as large as the world, for he contains it. All that is spread before me, these monasteries, these inns, the boats on the river, the villages, and what I see in the distance of fields, canals, sand, and mountains, is nothing in respect to what is in me. I carry in my heart countless cities and illimitable deserts, and evil, evil and death spread over this immensity cover them all as night covers the earth. I am, in myself alone, a universe of evil thoughts. He spoke thus because the desire for woman was in him. The seventh month there came from Alexandria Bubastus and Saïs, women who had long been barren, hoping to obtain children by the intercession of the holy man and the virtues of his pillar. They rubbed their sterile bodies against the stone. There followed a procession as far as the eye could reach of chariots, palanquins, and litters, which stopped and pushed and jostled below the man of God. From them came sick people, terrible to see, Mothers brought to Paphnutius young boys whose limbs were twisted, their eyes starting, their mouth foaming, their voices hoarse. He laid his hands upon them. Blind men approach, groping with their hands and raising towards him a face pierced with two bleeding holes. Paralytics displayed before him the heavy immobility, the deadly emaciation and the hideous contraction of their limbs. Lame men 
showed him their club feet, women with cancer, holding their bosoms with both hands, uncovered before him their breasts, devoured by the invisible vulture. Dropsical women, swollen like wineskins, were placed on the ground before him. He blessed them. Nubians, afflicted with elephantiasis, advanced with heavy steps and looked at him with streaming eyes and expressionless countenances. He made the sign of the cross over them. A young girl of Aphroditopolis was brought to him on a litter. After having vomited blood, she had slept for three days. She looked like a waxen image, and her parents, who thought she was dead, had placed a palm leaf on her breast. Paphnutius, having prayed to God, the young girl raised her head and opened her eyes. As the people reported everywhere the miracles which the saint had performed, unfortunate persons afflicted with that disease which the Greeks call the divine malady came from all parts of Egypt in incalculable legions. As soon as they saw the pillar, they were seized with convulsions, rolled on the ground, writhed, and twisted themselves into a ball. And, though it is hardly to be believed, the persons present were, in their turn, seized with a violent delirium and imitated the contortions of the epileptics. Monks and pilgrims, men and women, wallowed and struggled pell-mell, their limbs twisted foaming at the mouth, eating handfuls of earth, and prophesying. And Paphnutius, at the top of his pillar, felt a thrill of horror pass through him, and cried to God, I am the scapegoat, and I take upon me all the impurities of these people, and that is why, Lord, my body is filled with evil spirits. Every time that a sick person went away healed, the people applauded, carried him in triumph, and ceased not to repeat, We behold another well of Siloam. Hundreds of crutches already hung around the wonderful column. Grateful women suspended wreaths and votive images there. Some of the Greeks inscribed distiches, and as every pilgrim carved his name, the stone was soon covered as high as a man could reach with an infinity of Latin, Greek, Coptic, Punic, Hebrew, Syrian, and magic characters. When the Feast of Easter came, there was such an affluence of people to the city of miracles that old men thought that the days of the ancient mysteries had returned. All sorts of people in all sorts of costumes were to be seen there. The striped robes of the Egyptians, the burnous of the Arabs, the white drawers of the Nubians, the short cloak of the Greeks, the long toga of the Romans, the scarlet breeches of the barbarians, the gold-spangled robes of the courtesans. A veiled woman would pass on an ass preceded by black eunuchs who cleared a passage for her by the free use of their sticks. Acrobats, having spread a carpet on the ground, juggled and performed skillful tricks before a circle of silent spectators. Snake charmers unrolled their living girdles. Glittering, dusty, noisy, chattering crowd. The curses of the camel drivers beating the animals. The cries of the hawkers who sold ambulance against leprosy and the evil eye. The psalmody of the monks reciting verses of the Bible. The shrieking of the women who were prophesying. The shouting of beggars singing old songs of the harem. The bleating of the sheep. The braying of the asses. The sailors calling tardy passengers. All these confused noises caused a deafening uproar over which dominated the strident voices of the little naked negro boys running about everywhere selling fresh dates. And all these human beings stifled under the white sky in a heavy atmosphere laden with the perfumes of women, the odor of negroes, the fumes of cooking, and the smoke of gums which the devotees bought of the shepherds to burn before the saint. When night came, fires, torches, and lanterns were lighted everywhere. 
and nothing was to be seen but red shadows and black shapes, standing amidst a circle of squatting listeners, an old man, his face lighted by a smoky lamp, related how, formerly, Bithyu had enchanted his heart, torn it from his breast, placed it in an acacia, and then transformed himself into a tree. He made gestures, which his shadow repeated with absurd exaggerations, and the audience uttered cries of admiration. In the taverns, the drinkers lying on couches called for beer and wine. Dancing girls with painted eyes and bare stomachs performed before them religious or lascivious scenes. In retired corners, young men played dice or other games, and old men followed prostitutes. Above all these rose the solitary, unchanging column. The head with the cow's horns gazed into the shadow, and above it Paphnutius watched between heaven and earth. All at once the moon rose over the Nile, like the bare shoulder of a goddess. The hills gleamed with blue light, and Paphnutius thought he saw the body of Thais shining in the glimmer of the waters amidst the sapphire night. End of Part the Third Euphorbia Section 1